Opinions stated by various contributors to the Money and Business Show and related programs are not to be considered as endorsed by Radio Shalom, its employees, TE Wealth, TE Meradar, TE Financial Consultants, or TE Investment Councils, Inc. Visitors to this program are urged to use their own discernment to draw their own conclusions. Please read your prospectus and consult with your own investment advisor. Live from the studios of Radio Shalom, 1650 AM in Montreal, Canada, the city of Joie de Vivre, the world capital of culinary variety and the home of the Montreal Canadiens, this is the Money and Business Show with your host, Samuel Izerzer, consultant with T.E. Miradal, a national wealth management company answering to all your financial planning needs since 1972, known as T.E. Wealth in the rest of the country and headquartered in Toronto. Every week, Samuel and his guests discuss money, investments, financial services, and the world economy. Over the next hour, you can have your questions about business and personal finances answered. So call 514-738-4100, extension 200, to speak with Samuel and his guests. And now, here is the host of the Money and Business Show, Samuel Izerzer. Money, money, and business, the key to understanding stock options or, or options and how they can play a huge role in your making money to realize that you don't need thousands of dollars to get started. Yes, having thousands of dollars will help you reach your goals faster, but, but options investing allows you to invest small sums of money and quickly build up your account. Let's pretend the stock price for Apple just closed at $700, uh, more or less. So if you wanted to buy a share of Apple computer, it costs you about $700 plus commissions. So let's say one year later, the stock has gone up a value by 10%, you would have made roughly $70 on your $700 investment. Now earning 10% return on your money is great, but I wouldn't advise anyone to wait a whole year just to earn $70, just for one share obviously. Everyone knows the more money you invest in stocks, the more money you can make. Now let's see how the same $700 can be used with stock options or options investing and earn more. Options trading has always been a bit of pariah in the investing world. For the most part, it's considered by the financial community as a pursuit to complex and dangerous for anyone except for the professional trader. Even investing legends like Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch have nothing good to say about it. Lynch once wrote, Warren Buffett thinks that stock futures and options ought to be outlawed. He went on to say, I don't understand futures and options myself. An important qualifier and true of any investing opportunity, whether it be stocks, bonds, real estate, or pork bellies. You should never trade what you don't understand. Today in our studios on Radio Shalom, business headquarters in Montreal, we have Mr. Aaron Rand, host of the famous show, The Aaron Rand Show, to discuss options trading. Yes, Aaron has other talents than entertaining and poking fun at the Parti Québécois. <laughs> My name is Samuel Izerzer, your host for the Money and Business Show on Radio Shalom CJRS 1650 AM. Thank you for tuning in live on the Money and Business Show with our business studios headquarters in Montreal, the financial capital, and the home of the greatest hockey team, the Montreal Canadiens. We have another great show for you today. And as always, you can call if you have any questions, comments, or criticism on today's topic. Please um, call us directly, 514-738-4100, extension 200, or email me at moneybusinessshow at gmail.com if you have any inquiries. You can also visit our website, www.radio-shalom.ca. All our shows are archived, and I work as a financial consultant for T.E. Miradar, has been providing corporate executives, CEOs, families, employers, and employees with independent wealth management and financial education services since 1972. You can visit our website for my contact information at www.temeradar.com. Today, I have Mr. Brian Wolofsky, a trader himself. How are you? Just doing great, Sam. Sorry to laugh. The yeah, joy you of like, live you like. radio. <laughs> you catch me off guard with your jokes. <laughs> that was an introduction. You're not supposed to laugh. Yeah, what can I say? You yeah. cracked me up. Well, today we're going to be talking about options, something that is not very popular among uh, investors uh, and even brokers. So you want to explain a little bit about you know what our options are and you know how to play the call option um, uh, derivative? Um, yeah, I'd be delighted to. First of all, the term derivative is because options are derived from the value of the underlying security. The most commonly traded options are those on the Chicago Board Options Exchange, or SIBO, and their calls and puts, which relate to a stock or an index. Um, a call, one buys a call when one thinks the value of the underlying security will go up. 
So, but it has I, an expiry date too, right? It has an expiry date. It's very date. important that I mention that because most people say, okay, I'm going to buy this call and I'm going to wait. But they don't understand that there's a time value to it and it expires. Absolutely. And right. if you want later, we can talk a little bit about calendar spreads, okay. which are spreads, uh, options trades that are based on how much time to expire and how the value of the option expires as you get close to expiry. But let me start with the basics. You buy a call if you think the value of the underlying stock will go up. An example? You, you buy a put if you think the value of the underlying security will drop. So consequently, if you buy a put, if you think it's going to drop, then the strategy is if you think it's going to rise, instead of buying a call, you can sell a put. Or if you think a stock is going to drop, instead of buying a put, you can sell a call. And within those four concepts comes the idea of stock trading. And I'll throw in one more thing before you ask me the next question, which is whatever you do, always hedge it. The reason people who are not options traders say it's so risky is because if you short naked a put, which is to say sell without hedging a put, what if the value of the underlying stock falls to zero? Well, you're in trouble. Because if you've sold puts, that means someone can say, hey, you see this thing that's worth zero? I'm going to buy it for zero and sell it to you for whatever the strike price of the put was, and you could be in trouble. So the way you have to trade options is whatever you do, whether you buy or sell a call or a put, at some number, higher or lower, depending on what the option was, you have to sell or buy the exact same thing so as to hedge yourself and so just limit a, your loss. So just give us a little example on, on, let's say, buying a call or buying a put. Just, just very simple. All right. I'll give you a very good one. You said Warren Buffett doesn't like no, options. No, he doesn't like options. But no. that's not true. Because if Warren Buffett sees a stock, let's take Burlington Northern Railroad, for example, and he said, you know, that stock is worth $25, and all of a sudden it's trading for market conditions at $20, Warren Buffett may sell naked the puts at 15 Okay, so he takes in money for selling, and if the stock goes up, eh, he didn't get it, but he took in money for the puts that he sold. If it drops all of a sudden he owns a whole bunch of shares of Burlington Northern at a price he was happy with anyway. Good. So now I'm going to introduce Aaron Wren. Uh, began his radio career in 1974 working as a sports writer at CKGM when uh, Ralph Lockwood was still ruling the airways in Montreal. In 1982, he started his first morning radio show at CKGM, eventually teamed up with uh, Paul Zakayab also known as T uh, Tasso, with whom he would spend the next 30 years of his career. The pair ended up uh, on CFCF 600 in the spring of 1985, and then eventually on sister station CFQR, where they ruled the morning radio ratings for more than 10 years before being split up in 2009. And uh, now he's the host of the Aaron Ran Show weekdays from uh, 3 p.m. on CJAD. In addition to the radio, Ren has also a variety of business interests in Montreal, has written a short film, which he hopes to produce in the near future. I want to hear about that, the very near future, given that he wrote it in 1989. Hmm. So he also considers himself a new junkie and interested observer in the financial market. What, is that really true, that you, you still, it's still pending that movie? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wrote it in 1989. Any day now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and produce it. Any day? Yeah, I said that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 25 years ago. But yeah, it's getting closer and closer. Can't wait. I can't wait It'll for the opening. It'll be a retirement project. I can't wait for the opening. Make sure we announce it here on Radio, yeah. on radio Shalom. It's the first thing we're going to do. And the first and thing. you and I will be there. <laughs> right. Uh, Aaron, um, most Montrealers know you. You're the host of the Aaron Rand Show. You, you're very well known. And uh, you give interviews with top newsmaker, music, culture, and, and so much more. You know, the Montrealers you know, are up to speed of what's happening each day. But most listeners don't know what you follow the stock market. They don't, they don't know. What intrigues you about the, the, the stock market, Aaron? You know, maybe I, I could uh, put it best uh, by telling you a very, very short story. I was on an airplane one time going to New York City, and I happened to be sitting next to someone. We started chatting, uh, and she told me that her grandfather had been the person who opened the New York Stock Exchange. We started chatting, and I was interested in sort of, you know, from a from the outside looking in at the stock market, and she, she basically told me this, 
She said her grandfather, now remember, this is someone who was starting the New York Stock Exchange, told her one day, the stock market is like the casino. The only difference is it opens at 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> and, and that basically, at the end of the day, is something you have to just believe. I don't care how much information you think you know, someone knows more than you do. Uh, and if you know that, going in, it's, it's, for all intents and purposes, a little bit like going to the casino. You have to be prepared to lose. It's not simply about saying, well, that looks like a good idea. I'll put some money in and we'll all make money. It doesn't work that way, and I think most people know that. But for me, it's been a matter of, you know, studying. And I think the Internet has made a huge difference because, you know, 20 years ago, the people who did this professionally had all the information. So you were at a disadvantage unless you were a high net income individual who could go to the best broker anywhere and say, here's my $5 million, go ahead and invest it for me, they'd make money for you. But now it's much more, not perfect, but it's much more of a level playing field and you have access to all this information so you can hopefully make an educated guess. But Aaron, there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot. Yeah. And you have to know how to decipher from all that information. Yeah, absolutely. And the real of, of course what aaron said is to a certain degree absolutely right it is a casino and the only way to decipher between good information and bad information is experience when we were prop trading when i was learning uh on the knees of bob bright and rob friesen out in langley bc how to prop trade the first thing they told us was watch the futures and something called ticks which most of your listeners won't know what they are, but if you see the futures and the ticks moving one way, get prepared to move another way really, really quickly. So most people who aren't day trading, and certainly options traders are not day traders at all, it's a matter of the experience and knowing what to look for in the market to have a sense, do I trade for movement or do I trade a calendar spread, which is essentially they're going nowhere. So, Aaron, how, how does the morning start with you? I mean, you, you read the newspaper, Financial Times, the, the Wall Street Journal, I well, go on the Internet. Well, I, what do I, you do, I do my show prep for my show on CJD uh, first thing in the morning. So that will typically take me a couple of hours. So say I'm done by around, I don't know, 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And then for a little while, I'll, you know, because I'm active right now in the market, I have some positions on. I want to see what's going on, and I'll watch the, you know, sort of action unfold for the first half hour, hour of the day, which typically, depending on the stock, tends to be a pretty uh, significant time of the day. Sometimes I'd actually set the pattern for what happens the rest of the day, but then I watch and whatever my position is. I think it's important to explain one thing, and that is the fact that if you put $10 down, the idea is not to make necessarily 20 If you're buying an, if you're long an option position, if you hold calls and you paid a dollar for your calls... Uh, uh, long means you bought it, yeah. not sold it. If you bought that option position and you put a dollar down, you don't have to wait. And uh, just if I can give an example, maybe that'd be more concrete to understand. You mentioned Apple before. So Apple's trading right now at around $630 a share. So let's say I think that Apple, over the next period of time, whatever that period is, say six months, okay, is going to go to $700. It doesn't mean that it has to go right to $700. It just means that between the time I buy it at 630 and the time it expires in six months down the road, it needs to be going up as opposed to down. But if, if I bought that $630 call option, that strike price, $630, and in a week from now, the stock is at $650, my option will go from being valued, say, just an arbitrary number, a dollar, maybe now it's worth $1.75 or maybe $250. At that point, if I want to, I can pull the trigger and sell it. I don't have to wait for it to go to $700. So there are different ways to play. You know, if you want to be a conservative investor as far as an option goes, you don't have to wait. You can take your 10%, 20%, whatever number you set in your head and automatically cash out. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to what Aaron just said because it's really important. For all the math geeks out there, what happens is if your strike and the underlying price are pretty close and all of a sudden it moves pretty quickly from either below the strike, we're talking about owning, being long a call. And... The same works for being long a put in reverse. If if the strike is below the call price, and then all of a sudden, sorry, if the strike is above the actual price of the op, uh, the stock, the underlying, and all of a sudden the stock goes above the strike, so you have a 630 call, and Apple goes from 620 to 635, 640. The rate of growth of value of your option. The second derivative has been positive, if, if you math geeks know what I mean. And then at a certain point, as the, option val as the underlying value keeps growing above your call strike, 
the second derivative turns negative. There's an asymptote, and at that point, waiting longer makes no sense. So sell your call, reap the value of it, and then go on to the next thing. You do not have to wait till the end. Good. I think we're going to be taking a, a station break. Um, uh, I'm with uh, Aaron Ram. We're, we're talking about options, and also I'm with uh, Brian Wolofsky. Um, also, Aaron Ran is the um, is, is the is the host of the CJ, uh, on CJD of the Aaron Rand Show. Again, my name is Samuel Azurza for the Money Business Radio Show.